Why did God make things? Have you ever wondered that? Why did God make things? Why did God make this universe filled with things, with objects, with stuff? We have planets, we have weather, we have, we have colors, we have uh, animals, vegetables, minerals. We have people, people with runny noses, people with bulging blood. I know you don't want to think about these things, but why does God, why did God make things? Because God, I don't think God had to create this world. We, uh, in our uh, Supper and Study series back in the uh, uh, winter months of this year, we learned about how this, there is this entirely spiritual realm that exists. And God could have just made everything entirely spiritual. And uh, you know, no matter, no physical laws, just this, this spiritual realm, he, he, could have, he could have made everything well, he did make the angels, but, but why didn't he just stop with angels? Why didn't he just quit while he was ahead? He could have, could he not? Could God not have decided to make nothing at all and just carry on rejoicing in the fellowship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for, for all of eternity? And immaterial, entirely spiritual God, a God who we cannot see, a God that we cannot touch, created a thoroughly material and physical world. Why? And maybe that should surprise us more than it does. Maybe we, we don't ever give that a thought, but why did God create? You know, you're, you're reading your Bible, <clears throat> and uh, where are we, Aiden? Okay. I don't even know my own. Did you change them on the order of my slides, too? <laughs> okay. We'll get to that one. It's a new word for the day. But, you know, you're reading your Bible, and, and suddenly... Uh, there's this extended section in uh, Exodus or, uh, or uh, Leviticus about uh, uh, hair. You, you ever read all about hair? Or maybe locusts or water. And sometimes, you know, as you read that stuff, it feels as though this physical stuff like this, why is that? in a spiritual book like the Bible? We could answer that question in a lot of different ways. And one answer could be, would be, that God does not create because he has to create, because God lacks nothing, right? There's nothing that God lacks. Uh, God creates because, and I think some of the songs that we, we sang this morning, because it's his delight in being God, and that just spills out into a universe full of wonders. Another answer might be that um, the physical world is a kind of a, a display case of God's kaleidoscopic wisdom, and God's intelligence and God's creativity is so evident to us through all the different things that God has made. And that's actually the explanation in, in Psalm 104. The psalmist, who didn't have access to any encyclopedia, uh, didn't have internet access, he, the psalmist has this whole list of examples in Psalm 104 of things that God has made, valleys and lions and, and talks about storks and wine and, and rock badgers. And it goes on, and oil, goes on and on. And it gets to verse 24 of Psalm 104, and it exclaims, How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. And created things. I'm going to try and find my slides here, Aiden. I don't know. Okay. 
I seem to have eliminated a bunch of slides. But I've got my notes, so don't get too excited. We're still going. Okay. <clears throat> Created things, I think, teach us practical wisdom as well. And some of the passages that I have had highlighted, for example, uh, Proverbs. This one you probably know well. Uh, why did God make ants? Well, maybe ants show us the power of diligence because uh, so the writer of Proverbs says, go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. Another proverb, proverb 30, verse 33, tells us how churning butter teaches us about handling anger. For as churning cream produces butter, so stirring up anger produces strife. Hmm. Jesus talked about the power of a tiny mustard seed, the power of faith illustrated by, by the growth of a tiny mustard seed into a huge bush. And Jesus' teaching is actually full of a lot of things, isn't it? Uh, sheep and birds and flowers and coins and seeds and trees and fields, salt, light, rain, sunrise, all of these things teach us, instruct us how to live simply by being there. And so Paul, when you read the opening chapter of his letter to the Romans, he talks about how creation reveals God's invisible power and divine nature. And so for some people, the beauty and the majesty of creation triggers a song of gratitude and praise. We just want to sing, how great thou art. For others, it prompts us to ponder, what does creation tell us about our maker? And whether it triggers us to sing or it prompts us to ponder, the fact is that creation points beyond itself. Things exist not for their own sakes, but to draw us to God. Augustine imagined the gifts of God in creation, and he used this illustration. He said that the gifts of God in creation are like a boat which takes us back to our homeland. Creation is a means of transport which we can and should celebrate, but we don't want to mistake it for the destination itself. C.S. Lewis wrote about following the sunbeams back to the sun so that we enjoy not just the object of goodness, but the source of good. Creation preaches to us. The things of God reveal the God of things. And this is where this word comes up. This, this world is theomorphic. Things take the forms they do because they are created to reveal God. And so in scripture and sometimes in our, in our hymns and maybe in our, our conversation, we will talk about how God is the rock. Okay? We describe God as the rock just, just not just because that provides a good picture of safety and stability. Rocks exist because God is the rock, the rock of our salvation, the rock who provides water in the desert, the rock whose work is perfect, and all his ways are just. So thinking of the world as theomorphic paints a very different picture of the purpose of creation, of physical stuff, of things. And ever since the beginning, the surface of this planet has been covered with rocks. And every one of them, every one of those rocks has been preaching a message about the faithfulness, the security, and the steadfastness of God. And you need to think about that the next time you're out picking up rocks. 
because I know that's a popular pastime of farmers. Summer in Saskatchewan, it's a great time to consider creation. And so I'm, I want to do that over these uh, couple of months, few months that we have in uh, explore who is God? What do the created things reveal to us about God? And so we're going we're gonna to ponder some, some quite ordinary things of creation. Because, you know, we get caught up in the spectacular, the beautiful vistas, the mountains, the, the oceans. When we talk about the beauty of creation, that's the kind of pictures that we show on the screen or come to mind. But there's the ordinary things of creation that we easily overlook that also tell us important things about God and what we, and we can learn from them. And hopefully we'll get a, a deeper understanding of the world we live in and of the God who made it, as well as of the Bible. So, and maybe, maybe you might even see some of the things that we talk about in the coming weeks as you're out for a walk. And maybe, maybe you'll say, ah, I, I remember talking about that. And you get jolted out of your daydream into wonder and worship. At least this week, maybe, you'll not look at the rocks in the same way. But let's start. Let's start with a very basic thing that God created that goes unnoticed. Dust. Dust. I don't know how often you think about dust. Dust but we're continually touching it, we're breathing it. Some of you are more susceptible and you, you are more aware of that than others, but you're breathing a cocktail of hairs, pollens, fibers, soils, mites, and skin cells. The average person creates a third of an ounce of dead skin each week. That's about the weight of a car key. And that dead skin combines with everything else floating around to create household dust. And while that one third of an ounce every week doesn't seem like a lot, the average home, the average home, collects about 40 pounds of dust every year. And the biggest source of dust in the, in the entire world is the Sahara Desert. 770 million tons of dust from this desert blows across the Atlantic Ocean to South America, where it fertilizes the ocean and the Amazon rainforest. Wouldn't survive without that dust. This is a theomorphic world that we live in. Things take the form that they do because they are created to reveal God. And while the Sahara is the largest source of dust in the atmosphere, there is an estimated 5 billion tons of dust that is transmitted throughout the atmosphere each year. Facts about dust you never knew or cared to know except for the stuff that is sitting around. And when we notice dust, it's because we're trying to get rid of it, right? We're vacuuming, we're dusting, we're sweeping, we're cleaning behind the fridge or, or whatever. And dust is, is so easy to see on dark furniture. Uh, we have some furniture that look nice in the flyer, you know, black, but boy, Black furniture, you just, dust shows up. 
and you see it even before you run your finger across the surface. Other times, maybe like me, you notice uh, you're sitting and you see dust in a, in a beam of, of sunlight, um, and it illuminates that cloud of all these fine particles just floating in the air. I smell the dust. You know, on that first cold day of the year when you start up the furnace after it's been sitting idle all, all summer, and you smell, you can smell the dust. Dust. Dust speaks of decay because dust comes about through the decomposition of other things, whether it's animal, vegetable, or mineral. Dust in a home, dust in a home tells us that somebody has been shedding some dying cells recently, skin cells recently. On a construction site, dust tells us that something has been knocked down or destroyed. And when it hovers over the landscape, it tells us that plants probably will not grow very well because the soil is too shallow, the dust just blows, there's not enough rain, there's not enough moisture. Dust speaks of decay. And God says to us, we are made of dust. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground. And at least part of what it means to be dust people is that we will one day be dead people. When humanity chooses the tree of the knowledge of good and evil ahead of the tree of life, the sentence that is handed down is mortality. For you are dust, and to dust you will return. In a world where people so enthusiastically pursue life, sometimes at great expense, the Bible makes the certainty of death as clear as it can be. The writer of Hebrews says it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. We came from the soil. And one day, we will again be part of it. And as Christians, we don't deny, we don't downplay the certainty of death. Of death. But our ultimate hope revolves around resurrection. We're not here trying to escape death because that's going to happen to all of us unless the Lord returns before that. That's going to happen. We don't deny it. We're not trying to escape death. But our hope is resurrection from the dead. And our message centers on the one who died and was raised, not someone who carried on living indefinitely in uh, some sort of suspended animation. Our peculiar practices, going back a couple of weeks now, our peculiar practices of baptism and communion are graphically morbid practices. We bury people in water. We eat a broken body. And we drink blood, so to speak. And so as the wealthy in the world spend good money trying to avoid, or at least avoid thinking about death, part of the mission of the church is to remind them of the obvious. Now, that's not a very good marketing technique. That doesn't sell much product. Earth to earth. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But surprisingly, the first time that we're described as being created from dust actually doesn't have anything to do with death. It has to do with life, doesn't it? 
The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Adam, the Hebrew name which God used to refer to men and women, both male and female, is derived from the noun Adama, which means soil or earth. Adam. Adam's made from the Adama. Adam from the Adama. Remember, at this point, when this, these words are uttered, sin has not yet entered the world. Sin has not yet entered the garden. The tree of life is still available to humanity. And yet the narrative insists that we are created from the dust of the ground. So the focus here is not to remind us of our mortality here, because that's not in the picture yet. So what does this mean? The Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. In part, maybe it's a way of saying, reminding us that we're part of the physical creation. We are made of matter. We are made of stuff, right? We are physical, material beings. And we are created to bear the image of God, who is spiritual and invisible. And so it's important that we have tangible bodies that occupy space. We're not angels. We're not disembodied spirits. We are built from atoms and molecules and carbon and oxygen. But it's also a way of highlighting our supernatural God-breathed origins. There are all sorts of creation stories floating around the ancient Near East that Israel could have bought into, could have reflected. Um, and a lot of those stories from uh, other cultures talked about how humans were made out of clay. And most of us, most of us, with a bit of practice, we could take some clay and we could form it into something that looks somewhat like a person, right? You take that wet clay and you can compact it and you can create something out of it. But try to do that with dust. I think on the screen right here is the most complex shape that I could make out of dust, a pile of dust. And even then, all that I would need to do to get rid of that is, and it's gone, right? What causes a bunch of particles to come together into a human being when there's nothing inherent in those particles to bring them together. It's nothing less than the breath of God, which animates the dust and causes it to become a living soul. It's not clay, it's dust. And without the breath of God, we are nothing more than a pile of dust on the floor. But with the breath of God, we are bearers of the divine image. And that description of a human, the dust of the ground plus the breath of the Lord. And so we have the, the physical and the spiritual brought together here. That, that is comforting. That is uh, a source of comfort and confidence that we have from God's word. See, a, a Christian understanding of humanity places a strong emphasis 
on the image of God. And we need to always keep that in mind that all people, no matter how ugly they are, and I'm not talking physical, I'm talking uh, how uh, in their personalities, how ugly people might be, they are created in the image of God. And that is the, the fundamental dignity that is conferred on all humanity. We are kings, we are priests, we are ambassadors, we are rulers. We are, to quote Psalm 8, made a little, for a little while, lower than the angels, but we're crowned with glory and honor. And that has crucial implications for the way that we treat each other. Because I am created in the image of God, and so are you. But alongside that emphasis on dignity, there's also an appropriate humility that comes from remembering that, to quote, to use Genesis 18, this is Abraham saying, I am nothing but dust and ashes. And I think this is actually an encouraging word from the psalmist in those days that we just really mess things up. It's okay. God knows how we're formed. He remembers that we are dust. You're not superman. You're not superwoman. It's okay. Knowing that we come from the ground keeps us grounded. The Latin word humus means soil or earth. And that's where we get the words humility from. That's where the, we get the word human from, from humus. It's reassuring to know that God, in his compassion and his kindness, sees us not only as, as royalty who are expected to rule the world bearing his image, but also God sees us as dust and ashes, expected to fail sometimes, expected to cry out for rescue. Hannah sang it so beautifully. One of God's favorite hobbies is lifting people from the dust and ashes, marginal, broken, poor, and needy people like her and me and you and seeding us with princes. We're dust and to dust we shall return. Now, we may find that liberating, we may find that unsettling, or terrifying, but it's true. One day, the cells that compose us will be swirling in the leaves of autumn. One day, the cells that make up this body will be wedged between the cushions of a couch or hidden behind furniture. And the same is true of all the world's people, even the most powerful, the most influential, one day they will be dust. But only for a while. Because ultimately, as Daniel says, multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. And Ezekiel talks about how one day dry bones in a death valley are going to be filled with divine breath and raised to life. In Adam, 
In Adam, we are all dust people. And because we're all dust people, we decompose. But in Christ, we rise to become heavenly people for whom dust and decay, mortality and corruptibility are all things of the past. This is how Paul puts it to some people in Corinth who couldn't quite believe it. This is how he describes the resurrection. He explains that just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, Adam, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. Our future, Paul says, is not going to be molded on the man who came out of the soil, out of the humus. It's going to be molded on the man who came out of the tomb. So what's the take home for today? Maybe you need to get all your dusting and vacuuming done now because the new creation will be dust free. Let's conclude this morning. And I, I'm going to uh, conclude with uh, thanks for our potluck, talking about one of the beauties, the, one of the benefits of God's material world. It's potlucks. Why did God make potlucks? And we invite you all to stay and join us for that. So this week, as we kick off this uh, series of messages, I guess my, my hope is that, that uh, we just take a closer look at the world around you the goodness of the world in which you are distinct. But you're also transitory. You're dependent. The goodness of this world that is loved by God, whose goodness and faithfulness enables this world to exist. Taste and see how good our God is. And may this God bless you. May God show you the path to life. May God's presence fill you with joy. And may God be with you right by your side as you leave this place to serve him and his world. Amen.